Well, folks, welcome to the Land Tamer stream. It is Thursday night. Four days. Four days until the CCI routing and switching written exam. We'll be talking about my preparations, my final preparations for this second attempt. And we're going to be talking about a few topics uh, in depth somewhat. Just going to go over a couple of things that I studied today and last night. Uh, that I went a little more in depth into to make sure you know that I feel like I can at least explain it. I'm going to try anyway. This wallpaper of the day, by the way, folks, is from NASA Image of the Day. This is these are sand dunes on Mars, active sand dunes on Mars. Thought it was a really beautiful shot, man. Uh, the Matara crater. So anyway, cool stuff. That's our backdrop for the day. We're talking about subjects on the written exam and one thing uh i believe i got this right there was a question i was reviewing boson and again this is my and i want to just talk about this approach again folks what i realized on my first attempt is that i relied heavily on taking practice questions out of the boson exam material which is good it really helped identify a lot of weaknesses but by virtue of going over some of these questions multiple times, I realized that, you know, I was able to answer some of them just by repetition and not really so much as in a deeper understanding of the subject. So, so I'm owning that. I'm realizing that was a fundamental flaw in my approach from the beginning. So I started taking a boson exam, I don't know, last week again. I haven't been really been using it. Um... Since the first fail, which was in June, I've been kind of going over material based on my notes, post-exam. Then I started the boson exam again, but this time I've been going over all the questions. There's 500, and I've gotten through, I don't know, 400-something, but I'm stopping when I get to something that even if I know the, I feel like I know the answer, um... Maybe I want to make, I know inside of me why I got it, you know, is, did I get that because it's repetition or did I get that because I really know this material? So this time I decided, I've gone through and I decided, okay, some of these topics I'm going to hit, I'm going to go more in depth. I'm going to make sure that I really get them and you know when you get it, you know, but this is a way of me to also sort of uh, trying to explain these things to Fortify in my mind that I know the material, right? And one of those things that came up today was SNMP v3. And there's several configurations of SNMP v3. Of course, in v3, they introduced um, encryption. Uh, prior to that, SNMP v1 and 2, well, there's, there's of course, a 2 and a 2C. But essentially, 1 and 2... They introduced authentication, but the authentication really was plain text community string. That is the sort of authentication. Well, with SNMP v3, they introduced um, authentication that can be where you can use a hash algorithm to provide confidentiality for the authentication. In other words, the username, right? Um, and also encryption. So there, there's three options, basically. You can do uh, do not encrypt authentication, do not en encrypt or don't hash authentication and encrypt SNMP v3 authentication process. And I say process because what we're going to see today when we look at the packets, yes, there is an SM SNMP v3. There is encryption, but it's not encrypting the entire contents of the pack it's not like ipsec right where it's essentially um keeping confidential the entire message no but the actual components that are important to authentication in other words you know if i want to hack into a network and let's say i'm a hacker and i want to hack into the network and i want to be able to see who are the devices on the network that use SNMP because with, with SNMP v3 there, there's there's a couple scary parts of it if you have unauthorized access one is you can not only read information and obtain a lot of information about the network 
But with SNMPv3, you can actually write information. So if you're really sophisticated and you knew uh, and you could, you know, decode what was going on, you could figure out a way to craft uh, messages to make changes in the network, right? So that's why not just uh, the authentication string or the, uh, you know, the authentication component of the SNMP message is important, but there are other pieces that are important too. And essentially without that, you're not going to be able to authenticate to another SNMP v3 server, right? So that's why if you're using SNMP, v SNMP in your network, A, you should be trying to use SNMP v3. And you should, unless you're in a lab or something like that, you should be using... Uh, authentication, hashed authentication, and encryption. So those are the three options, right? You have no auth, no priv, which is clear text. Uh, auth, no priv, which means authentication is not in clear text, but the other parts of the SNMP v components are um, not encrypted. And then you have auth priv, which is the highest level of security. Uh, authentication is hashed and you have encryption of the authentic and notice here and I have it a point to be specific this is encryption of the authentication data not necessarily of the some of the SNMP v3 data and we're gonna see that I wanted to look at it myself that was my first question when I was reading about this okay we've got authentication hash we've got encryption what is exactly is it encrypting so I found a good, there's a link here, I found a good link to a capture that I've got on my desktop. And we're going to look at SNMP v1. We're also going to highlight how in Wireshark that you can decode encryption. And I'll show you how it works because obviously with a PCAP, if you just have a PCAP, you're just looking on the wire you're going to see it like, you know, someone who might be intending to hack into your network might. It's going to be encrypted. This is, and so there's a way to tell Wireshark what um, the algorithms are and what the secrets are so that you can actually decrypt SNMPv3. You can do that with a lot of other protocols too, including SSH, right? Or um, I know SSH and some HTTPS. Uh, depends on the TLS type, right? But here's SNMPv1. As you can see, you have a source, a uh, destination. It looks like these are on the same, you know, uh, broadcast domain. And you have here uh, UDP, of course, 161. And then SNMPv, SNMP. And it has the version included in the... What type is this, by the way? UDP... Yeah, the protocol here, the IPv4 protocol is just 17, which is UDP. But as in the case of a lot of UDP traffic, it's frequently identified by, like, destination port. And in 161, we know that's SNMP, um, and this is SNMPv1. That's identified here. There's a zero in this field. And then community is public. Now, generally, by default, devices, if you enable SNMP, um, public is the community that is turned on. So if you want to, you know, it wouldn't be hard to hack into a noob network that's got SNMP in use and enabled and no restrictions, and they're using the public community string, right? So we obviously don't want to be doing that, but here's a get request for data and request ID, variable bindings. I don't know what all this information means. Uh, this is the format. These are uh, object names that are typical in SNMP, but this is V1, right? We've got no encryption. We can read everything here. Uh, service request, we got, uh, that service location, SNMP, get request, get response, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so then we go to SNMPv3, 
And it's all from that link, by the way. And you all can follow along if you want. I need to do a better job of just pasting this stuff as I go. I looked at a couple places, and Wireshark site had the best one for what I was looking for. Okay, so this is the V3, and I think I've got my secrets already in here. So I'm going to go back in and take them out. If you look on that link, it tells you what the secrets are. Obviously, you, you can't just derive this from the packet capture. Uh, that's the part about the encryption that's important. I mean, unless you have it, you're not going to be able to read it. So you go into your Wireshark preference to do this, and there's a lot of protocols where you can change the preferences, which is a lot of different uh, parts of the protocol. You know, like ports, like let's say you're on a network, and instead of um what's the 3389 that's the default port for remote desktop maybe on your network someone has changed it to an arbitrary value of 3928 well if you're capturing that traffic you want to analyze it troubleshoot it you can come in here and change the port number so that when you're reviewing it in wireshark um it will reflect the, the state of the network you're analyzing but let's go down to SNMP here. There's a lot of protocol customization you can do. A lot of protocols that, out of the box, that Wireshark recognizes. But I can go into a users table, and here they are. So just for illustration, folks, I'm going to modify some things in here. And I'm going to change the password to something that's wrong. I'm going to take one of the X's out. But this is where you would come in and say, okay, for this username, this is the authentication model. This is the password. This is the privacy protocol and the privacy password. I want to change all these so that we can see what it looks like to a would-be hacker who has only come to discover that, oh, darn... Uh, what is it not like? Duplicate key, username, popo3, engine field, none. Not sure. Something doesn't like there. Okay, I'm going to clear all these out then. Okay, so boom, this is what it looks like. Wireshark is going to tell you, hey, all right, I know this is SNMP. Uh, I know it's, you know, the header itself is not encrypted, only unless you're using, um, like, IPsec can you encapsulate and encrypt the original header, right? We're not talking about that type of encryption, like I said. Destination port, it knows it's one, uh, it knows it's version three, it knows what some of these fields are, but the content inside of the field, it's saying, uh, this is encrypted. I do not know the private key. I cannot interpret the output here. Authentication parameters, that's all scrambled, basically. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't tell you. Now, message data. Uh, on this particular message type, it does encrypt the message data. I swear, though, I saw down here, maybe I told you wrong. Okay, maybe it does encrypt the contents. I thought I saw some packets where it was using encryption, but I could still see. Oh yeah, see, okay, that's a good response. Okay, well, maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe it does encrypt the entire message, which would make sense. It wouldn't make a lot of sense. See, that's why I do this, so that I can present it and uh, shore up my own understanding here. All right, so we're going to go back to this link, and we're going to enter, just so you can see it start to finish. This link, you know, uh, Wireshark Org, it tells us what the... Uh, Authentication and encryption is configured for. So we're going to go back in here to Preferences. Protocols. I shouldn't have closed it out. SNMP.
And we're going to enter this in here. Add a uh, username Pippo MD5 uh, password P I P P O X X X. Oh, it's under under score or lowercase P I P P O X X X. And the privilege password is P I P P O X X X. Okay, this one is P I P P O 2. This is uses SHA 1. And DES for privacy or encryption. P I P P O X X X. Looks like we've captured packets from three different SNMP, fee, SNMP user accounts. PP, PIPO3, this uses SHA and AES. I can never remember what the acronyms are for these protocols. Like SHA1, S-H-A. Uh, I hope I never have to memorize those. I'm sure if you're taking your uh, security track, you do, but, man, AES. I know I've read them a bunch of times. All right, now, we put that in, and voila. Wireshark is um, decrypting this for us so we can do our analysis, you know, verify everything. Uh, this says encrypted PDU. Plain text, plain text, plain text. Okay, Pippo2. I might have got him wrong. All right. That's essentially how you do it, folks. Um, so that's cool stuff. That's the first time I've done this. Actually, I've attempted to do this with, with SSL traffic. Uh, when I was trying to assist one of our developers, and we were trying to figure out some issues that were going on with SSL. And hey, we have uh, Chantel, Chantel, uh, Chantel Mocha. Chantel Mocha, thank you very much for the follow. Appreciate that. Welcome to Land Tamer Stream, where we talk all sorts of networking goodness. And we focus on the good bits. Uh, so I may be covering up the chat window here. Hey, Chantel Mocha, there you are. Good to have you, my friend. So yeah, that's uh, that's how you do it. And again, I've done it before for SSL, where I, I mean we were troubleshooting uh, a difficult issue. Like uh, it was for a load balancer, and I was doing some health checks. And, you know, I was doing uh, open SSL command from uh, on an F5. You know, it's basically you get a bash shell. You can it, it runs on, you know, its own uh, variant of Linux. And, you know, I could do I could do packet captures on the F5 and I could look and I was saying, look, everything here looks good. It's got to be your SSL configuration on your box. And so. There was a particular time where I actually attempted to SSL. I wasn't trying to hack, folks. Um, I was just trying to decrypt the SSL. And certain TLS types, even if you go into Wireshark and import the private key, you're still not. It's still going to be unable to decrypt. And that's why a lot of times when people are doing uh, vulnerability scans on your network. And, you know, for example, we, we host uh, some things on our, on our network. Uh, we host some, some SSL traffic. And, yes, we, if, you know, we're using certain versions of TLS, the older versions, they need to be disabled, you know, on your network because for that very reason. So, um, and if you have any of those enabled and you have professional services come in and, and you know, they're doing regular vulnerability scans, uh, they're going to find that and they're going to cite you. And you're going to have to fix it. So, anyway, that's SNMPv3. Uh, good stuff. Another thing I wanted to cover is actually two other things. Uh, one is this question here. What is the per hop behavior value of EF, which is expedited forwarding, in hex? And this goes back a little bit yesterday. You know, I covered some information about QoS 
or actually maybe two days ago. And I came across this again today, and I didn't get it exactly right. Well, I didn't have my knowledge as, as firm as I needed to, and now I do, and I think I, because I'm going to try to explain it to you. So remember we talked about the other day, and let me pull up just sort of a little diagram here, just a little notepad. Um, the other day we talked about how in an IPv4 Ethernet header, there is a, a reserve field to insert information for the purposes of, you know, quality of service. Those are called the TOS bits or type of service bits. And let's see, let's pull one up. We just had SNMPv3 open, right? So this is an IPv4 packet. And, well, we talked about this too. So TOS, or type of service, um, it, it was 8 bits. But the IETF came back and they said, all right, really we're not using that anymore. What we're using is we're going to take six of those bits, ah, six bits, and that is the new uh, standard, which is DSCP, differ Differentiated Services Code Point. And we're going to have two bits, and that is going to be for uh, ECN, which is uh, Expedited change notification thank you show good to have you my friend glad to see you on it i hope you're doing well i know you're probably getting ready to uh, go hardcore labbing buddy so um but yeah so we've got these bits so this is great right it's all fine and good we we already kind of went over this and i had this present in my mind already when when this information hit me right so there are certain and these map as well, DSCP, DSCP the first three bits. Um, soon, yes, sir. All right, show. Uh, the first three bits correspond and are backwards compatible to the class of service, or actually class service is layer two, or IP precedence values, right? And then you have three more bits that are used for uh, DSCP. And in combination they can mean different things. Generally, lower is more important than a higher number. Um, generally speaking, uh, when you start looking at the last three bits and the drop uh, values, uh, that can be different. But these all map to certain um, uh, fields, right? Or certain designations. One of those very important special designations is and oh man i believe it's 46 which is expedited forwarding in fact let me pull up a chart here that instead of me typing this out uh let's see if we got an image here we go So yeah, these are class selector, which are the CS one through or zero through seven. But if you look at a bigger chart, you can see some of the other ones. Um, here we go. This looks, I don't know if that's it. I made a chart. Um, yeah, AF are assured forwarding values, um, EF. Uh, there you see expedited forwarding. So some of these are special. They have special uses to routers. Um, okay, this is zero, routine, equivalent IP precedence value. Uh, AF11 is 10, right? And then I was trying to find a chart to show you EF. This looks like a pretty good chart. I... I look before for a really good chart, and I end up making my own, but this one's actually better than the one I did. 
This is cool. I may pull this out. Um, well, that's my Google search. Brave does that, guys. That's one bad thing I will say about Brave. And that just takes you to the blog. I don't know why it handles that really weird. Anyway, um, so here we have expedited forwarding. That has special meaning. It's 46. It's used a lot with voice. But let's say we have expedited forwarding, which is a value of 46. All right? PHB, that's per hop behavior. You know, that's a uh, fancy name for COS or, you know, QoS values in the IPv4 header. So how do we convert that to hex? Why would you want to convert it to hex? Well, there are several reasons. One is if you are looking at it, you know, if you're looking here at a packet in Wireshark, um, it's going to show you the DSCP. I don't think it, oh, it does. It actually tells you this is CS0. Okay, so maybe Wireshark will tell you the... Uh, DSCP code for you, which makes sense. Well, what if you're using some other tools? Maybe you're doing a, a dump at the console. You know, maybe you're doing uh, embedded packet capture. And maybe you're doing a show IP cache flow command. You're looking at NetFlow, you're troubleshooting. You want to make sure that this traffic has the correct uh, DSCP code. So what would 46 be in hex? All right, let's, let's find out, all right? Remember that the DSCP code field is six bits. So all we do is we start from zero, we go backwards, right? And we think uh, 46, so this is going to be one. I always go one, two, four, eight, 16, 32. So 32, and I have 14 left over. Uh, my next bit would represent 16. That, that's too big. So we'll go to 8. We're going to take 8. Um, and that would get us to 40. And we're going to take 4 and 2. And that should total up 46, right? So that would be the first bit, third bit, fourth bit, fifth bit. Good. So then we're, we made it to, from decimal to binary. And for binary, all you have to do is convert to hex. Well, if you convert this to hex, um, it's not going to work. <laughs> Remember, originally, this entire field, the type of service is 8 bits. And when you are looking at a stream, or when you're looking at a dump of a packet in hex, um, it's going to parse this out into 8 bits. Granted, we don't care about these two for the DSCP, but you need to include those, right? When you're analyzing the, the or converting to hex. And in this case, you'll be converting backwards, right? You'll be taking it from hex, uh, likely to binary, or I don't know if you can do it to decimal. Um, probably going direct to decimal. <laughs> But if you did decimal then to binary and looked at it, you might be confused if you forgot about these two bits. So don't forget about those. Then what you do is you take your four bits and you convert that to a hexadecimal value. And I always have to go back to uh, decimal, then hexadecimal. That's just me, right? Um, so you've got one, two, four, eight. And I think I'm doing this wrong. Hold on a second. Uh, one, two. Oh, that's right. Yeah, one, two, four, eight. So we've got eight plus two plus one is 11 in decimal. And over here, we've just got eight. So what is 11 in hex? Um, that would be, let me make sure I got that right now. I'm doubting myself. One, two, three, plus eight is 11. Yeah. Um, so that would be in hexadecimal, um, 
always have to go like 9, 10 is A, 11 is B, <laughs> B8. All right. So that would be your answer. The PHB, the per hop behavior value for expedited forwarding in hex is B8. Okay. That's what you would see show IP cache flow or, um, of course, this one uh, we had in our packet capture is zero. So that's really easy to identify. But that's how you do it, folks. And there's probably other videos that explain that much better, guys. But uh, that's the method I've developed for now, and that's what I'm going with for now, going into the written exam. It may not be super fast, um, but I don't expect to get a lot of questions like this. Some of them I can identify right away. Like I've gotten used to seeing... Um, I think it's five zero in hex is eighty, like that's HTTP, right? So that's how you do it. Speaking of QoS, um, I actually found some really good information. I was reviewing again a little bit of policing, and. Guys, this explanation here is, I think I attempted to give an explanation Wednesday night. Compared to Kevin Wallace and this particular video, and it's short too. He does in probably a fourth of the time that I did it. He explains, um, I think he explains both policing and shaping in this part one video of QoS, um, more advanced QoS fundamentals and it was really good i highly encourage you to watch it uh, if you're studying this stuff and then this one is on red and wred i have not got part i've not made it through parts three he has a three one and a three two i haven't made it through those yet i don't know if i can recommend that i mean i, I want to see him before i just send any uh tamers out to just spend their time to watch a video and i didn't think it was it was good but these two are really good guys so i highly encourage you to watch those they will not take that long to watch and he uses some great analogies and then i was studying also uh policers two rate single rate and two rate policers this is in my drill sheet and i think this of course is important for the written exam To be honest, I'm not sure I got any questions about this, but I definitely expect to get a question or two or three about this. Maybe I did get one. I don't remember, but it's obviously part of the blueprint, so you need to know it. Um, yeah, I have just a summary right here, policing options in the drill sheet. So oftentimes you have, you know, single rate, two color, single rate, three color, and two rate, three color. And this is the number of buckets associated with each. This generally goes um, I'm not sure this is right. I think that's one bucket. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and look at that now. But, you know, single rate means you have your committed infor information rate. All of these use a committed information rate in policing. But in some cases... Um, you have a PIR as well, and these are the actions, and this has to do with the colors, so, uh, I think, you know, conform is green, exceed is yellow, and violate is red, and essentially what happens is you have, uh, this does have three color, okay, it does have two buckets, yeah. And that comes with, with violate because what happens is as long as you're conforming, that's green. You're using your token buckets for that. Um, then you have exceed, which is like uh, a burst. So there's a uh, burst amount. And then you have a violate policy. And violate generally is, uh, usually it means that you're, it's going to be dropped, right? So you can either mark or drop in policing. But really good videos there, folks. Um, and here's a detailed document about uh, two-rate policing. 
in detail. And that's really all I got, folks. I got to get to doing some more studying. Uh, you might have to do the same. Um, yeah, obviously I got four days. Uh, I'm off. So this is my Friday Eve, which is great. Today was rough because any time that you're trying to take days off, I don't know why. It's been this way throughout my career. Anytime you try to get ready to take a day off, you feel like there's all this stuff you got to do before you leave because um, erroneous, erroneously, you might think, while I'm not here, all this crap is going to break, which is so not true. <laughs> Generally, it's not. Uh, but in our minds, you know, we, we want things to go well while we're away and, and I, you know, you don't want to get called. So anyway, uh, I was very busy this week trying to get to a point where I could stop, which I did right at about 5 p.m. today. Uh, but I skipped lunch. I mean, uh, anyway, excited. I got Friday. My strategy is, again, I got tomorrow, all day tomorrow to study, all day Saturday to study, all day Sunday to study. Monday, I go into the exam Monday morning. So my plan is to do that and take some breaks, you know. Get my rest. Last night I did good. I went I went to bed on time. I got up early this morning. I did my workout. Went to the gym. Uh, I got you know my butt beat at the gym. <laughs> Crazy workout, and that's all good. And I plan to do that, and you know keep keep the uh, the mind healthy, sharp, well rested, ready to go. That's my plan. So anyway, I'll keep y'all posted. Four days ago. Uh, I will be streaming. I, you know, I'll do a stream tomorrow. Probably the the normally I'm off Fridays, but I am gonna do a quick stream probably around noon, something like that, and then Saturday noon and then Sunday noon hopefully, and then uh, Monday night I'll come back and stream my normal time and just let you know how it went. So thanks, folks, for hanging out. Uh, good to see folks in the chat, new folks too. Hope you enjoyed this this stream and enjoy the networking goodness. Uh, that's what we do uh, at the Land Tamer stream and in our Discord. Uh, this is a link. If you haven't joined the Discord yet, check it out. We got a Google Drive. Uh, I have some other uh, social media things that I cannot remember the command for. Uh, yeah. Twitter. So, yeah. Follow me there. Keep abreast. Follow me on my journey. Maybe you're, you're thinking about t taking the same journey yourself or you're in the midst of a certification journey. We'll encourage each other, right? We'll share our energy, share tips, help each other out. That's what we do. So thanks for hanging out, folks. Hope you have a good Thursday or Friday Eve, Thursday night, and wish you the best. Uh, you know, follow through on your plans. If you're planning to do labbing, studying, uh, whatever you got on your agenda uh, to progress your cert, I wish you the best and sending you all the good bits through the airwaves and the networks. Have a great night, folks. We'll see you back here tomorrow. The Land Tamer Street.